excited for today because we are continuing this series that we've been on over the last few weeks called Happily Even After. And the whole thing is we're considering marriages and relationships and uh, uh, everything that goes into them. A couple weeks ago we talked about love and um, what that looks like uh, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our friendship, what love looks like. Last week we, we talked about uh, brokenness and I'm kind of God's foundation for our relationships and, and how it all began at the very beginning of time. If, if you missed anything over the last couple weeks, uh, I strongly encourage you to jump online. You can jump on our YouTube channel and check it out and catch up. Uh, it's been a good couple weeks. Um, if I can be very transparent with you, it's been better than I expected. Um, and I expected it to be really, really good. So uh, it's been great. If you've missed any of it, jump online and, and, and catch up. You won't be lost today, but it could be some beneficial things. And one of the most complex things when it comes to our uh, relationships and our marriages is, is communication. I think that usually in our relationships when we have uh, issues, we always... Um, consider conflict. We, we, we automatically look at conflict when it comes to the issues. But the reality is that communication is the predecessor to conflict, right? We will have conflict if we are not good at communication, so let's master communication so we don't have conflict, right? And really, it can be the most detrimental thing or it can be the most beneficial thing uh, in each one of our relationships. I read this story this past week about this man who lacked... Uh, tact. Any, any of you, would, would you say maybe you don't have the most tact in the world? A couple of you. A couple of you, I'm like, no, you need to raise your hand. <laughs> We've talked. Uh, maybe you lack tact, right? I read this story about this guy who lacked tact. And, uh, and, and he was the type of person who couldn't say anything graciously. And Him and his wife, they had this poodle, this dog, and, and the dog was everything to them. It was the object of their affection. And, uh, and one day the, the, the wife was going on this vacation to Europe, and on her first day of her trip, she phones home, and she asks her husband, uh, how's everything going? And he replies back to her, and he says, uh, the dog's dead. <laughs> and uh, devastated, she replies back to her husband, and she says, you could have handled that better. You know, you could have said that more graciously. And, and he said, what, what would you prefer? The dog died? Uh, <laughs> And she said, no, you could have given it to me in stages. So she says, uh, like on day one, maybe you say, hey, the dog, you know, went out on the roof. And, and, and then on day two, I call back home and I say, how's everything? And you say, well, the dog fell off the roof and the dog is at the vet. And, and to be honest, he's not doing very well. And then on day three, I call home and, and I say, how's the dog? And you say, well, I hate to say it, brace yourself, but... Uh, the dog passed away. And she says, I could handle that. I could handle the stages, right? And, and, and the husband replies back to me. He says, okay, you know, I understand. And they kind of regain their composure. And she says, by the way, how's mother doing? And the husband replies back, she's on the roof. <laughs> you get it. <laughs> I was nervous about that one. Good morning. Communication is important, right? How we talk is important. Um, the words that we use, they're important. It's a skill set that we lack most of the time. And again, this is something that we've heard. I think that if, if you're married, you've heard at some point in your life that communication is key to your relationship, right? We, we understand that. And, and like we talked about last week, we get this stuff. We just don't always employ it. Bernard Shaw said the single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it's taken place. That, that, that communication has actually happened. It's the biggest illusion. It's funny because this is the thing that gets broken down so much just in our everyday life, let alone in our marriages and our relationships and the things that we are uh, closest to. It's constantly getting broken down. So it's crucial for us to overcome for the sake of our relationships. If you have your Bibles this morning, flip them over to Proverbs. I'm going to bounce around today. Of course, it's in your notes, and it's on the screen behind me. There are 120 Proverbs devoted to human speech. The only thing uh, that Solomon writes about more in the book of Proverbs is wisdom. 
he is this, he is this writer who is so incredibly in tune with what human nature is. And, and he understands the value of speech, so he writes about it almost more than anything else. It's written in such a way that, that allows us to apply it to our life uh, very, very easily. It's about as pragmatic as it gets. And, and, it's, and, and the way that he writes it is in a way that describes how life is, not how we want life to be. Okay? It was written by Solomon. He has this, this uh, innate understanding of, of human nature. And more specifically, the power of words and the power that words have on us and the power that our words have. He says this in Proverbs chapter 18. He says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The way we speak creates this hailstorm of chaos sometimes. And without thinking, we can absolutely crush people. We can destroy dreams. We can destroy hopes. We can fill people with resentment. We can elicit fear. Words have the power of life and death, right? You with me? You awake? For the life of me, I have absolutely no idea why we would ever choose the death side of words, but we all do it. And I don't understand why we do it. I don't get why we do it. I understand that we do it, but I don't understand why we do it, how we can do it. I'm sure you've probably been the recipient of, of, of some of those words at some point in your life. I'm sure that you've been the author of some of those words at certain points in your life. Henry Cloud says like this, he says, if you go to work or school tomorrow, the people that you see have their heads hanging low, are sad, depressed, or burned out. You can usually trace it back to hurtful interaction they've had with someone. When someone is hurting, 99% of the time, somebody else's words were on the other end of that. The flip side of this is, is that if our words bring life and death, they don't always bring death. Sometimes our life brings, or our words bring life, Right? Sometimes our words bring people up. The right words at the right time can, can show someone how they're loved. It can, it can bring guidance. It can uh, give hope. It can build life into people. Specific words. I think that so frequently in church we talk about the death side of the words, but the reality is there is so much life in the words that we speak to each other, to the people that we love, to, to our spouse. Words not only tear down and break relationships and marriages, but words are the very place that relationships begin to heal, right? Throughout life, we have these moments that, that get burned into our brain, right? These memories that, that, that get etched into our brain. This, this past week, I, I get in my car, and I, um, I always have music playing. And, and so um, normally, it's a very stressful thing, me picking music. Um, and this past week, I just, I just hit play on iTunes, and I was like, we'll let iTunes decide. And it's like radio, right, essentially, and this song came on uh, on my phone called Mr. Wendell from 1991. Does anyone know it? No, one of you? Do you? Right? Oh, man. We have a listening party after this. So <laughs> this song comes on from 1991 by this group called Arrested Development. Remarkable song. I have no idea what it's about. <laughs> I think maybe a homeless person, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh -huh. It's so good, though, right? And, and instantly... It took me back to 1991 with me and my sister, and we would sneak in, uh, and we would watch MTV, waiting for Mr. Wendell to come on. Um, and we'll edit this from the video so my mom doesn't know, but we weren't allowed to watch MTV. <laughs> Some of you are like, what's he talking about? Uh, my parents didn't let us watch that. That was back then when music came on it, uh, and then they don't do that. I don't, is that, I don't even know if it's still a channel anymore. Maybe. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> so I've got this memory in my head, right, of, of going in and listening to this song. And there are things that get etched into our brain that make no difference whatsoever. Where I heard this song come on the radio the other day, and I thought, man, this song is so good. I'll listen to it twice on my way to work. And then another song came on that brought back a whole different memory. But things get etched into our brain that don't necessarily matter, things like that. Sometimes memories don't matter, but sometimes memories do matter. It's scary because uh, things get logged in our brain and stored in our brain, and, and sometimes we don't want them stored in our brain. A lot of stuff doesn't matter, and a lot of stuff does. And a lot of those things that get logged into our memory only serve to bring us down. 
Some of them are far more threatening. Maybe you have people in your life that have, that have said good things to you, but they've also spoken very negative things into your life, things that you don't want to be in your brain, things that you don't want to remember. When I was in 10th grade, we, uh, I, actually, I lived here, and, and I went to Kelso High School, and then we moved away, and I went to this school in Cincinnati, Ohio. And it was this, this, this small private school, and, uh, and I hated every single minute of it. And uh, on my first day of school, I was standing in the cafeteria right up front with the school counselor as he was explaining to me how cafeterias work. <laughs> Even as a 10th grader, I thought, come on, man. Um, but he's explaining to me how cafeterias work, and, and I'm standing at the front. And it was a very, very small, private school. And so everyone was aware that I was there, right? I was the new kid. I had all of their attention. They're watching me. Worst day of my life. Um, whenever the whole school was looking at you as the new kid, uh, it was miserable for me. And I remember thinking, man, I cannot wait until this is over. And eventually he, he let me go, and I went and I sat down at this table by myself. It's just how I live my life. <laughs> and I sat down at this table by myself, and I remember sitting there, and I was getting ready to eat lunch, and this kid called Mark comes up behind me, and he whispers in my ear four words that would absolutely ruin any 10th grade boy's life on his first day of school. Your fly is down. <laughs> Here's the thing. I tell you this, what, 20 years later, because it is etched in my brain, <laughs> those four words. We've got these stories, and you've got your stories, and, and maybe that seems like an exaggerated one. It's not. I still think about it. We've all got stories in our life that, that get etched into our brain. Some of them matter and some of them don't. Some of those things we, we, we wish that we wouldn't have heard, things that we, we wish we wouldn't have said, maybe hurtful things, degrading things, discouraging things, maybe accusatory things, judgmental things. There are these things that, that, that cause impact on our life. And we tend to forget or lack the appreciation for the positive things, generally because the negative things are so much louder than the positive things. The negative words that we hear are so much bigger and obvious than the small little positive things here and there. And it doesn't matter if 15 people tell you something incredibly good, if one person tells you something negative, it, that's usually what we hear, right? We normally hear that negative thing. One of my favorite things about this this series so far and so much of what we've talked about over the last couple weeks is that there are things that we know and we've heard. So much of what uh, I have said over the last few weeks, we, un we know, we understand it. If you've been here, you probably know. We, uh, the first week we used a passage of scripture that every person in the history of time has heard because it's like the wedding scripture, right? We're saying things that we talk about and we know. Maybe you've even sat in some services over the last couple weeks and you've nodded your head. You know, oh, I agree, right? You know how that goes? Some of you need to nod more. Now would be one of those times. Maybe you've even gotten courageous and thrown out an amen, you know? Not the 9 o'clock, but if you attended at 1030. <laughs> I'm just joking. So it begs the question of why. Why is there this breakdown in communication when I can come on stage and say we need to build up communication? When communication is so incredibly valuable and important, and we know that, why is there a breakdown in it? I got some thoughts for you. Here's the first one. There's a breakdown because of gender differences. It's your first fill in the blank. Gender differences. Men and women are different, right? Regardless of what they keep telling us, men and women are different. Not just biologically. There are some generalizations that hold true, okay? The average man speaks 6,000 words a day. The average woman speaks 9,000 words a day. Right? And ladies, you know who you are. Some of you are bringing up the average. No, I'm just joking. I'll take that off the video. There are differences, right? Women have a bigger hippocampus, which is the place where all your memories are stored. It's why I know for certain that Shana can remember every word from every argument that we have ever had. Because <laughs> her memory is better than mine. And usually every argument ends in, I told you that. You know? Sorry. We literally see things differently. Men have thicker retinas than women do. We hear music differently. We feel things differently. There are major differences in our genders. And as a result, this breakdown in communication happens. That's why we have to be able to recognize it and enlist grace. 
right? Because we view things differently. Second thing is there's this relational drift. We're really, because there's this gravitational pull on our relationship where maybe we were really, really close at one point, all of a sudden we're being pulled apart. And communication is difficult because one of us is over here and one of us is over here and we can't hear each other any longer. And there's this relational drift. The next thing's past baggage. Of course, we probably know this more than anything. And we ever carried baggage into a relationship before? Are you still carrying baggage in your relationship? We carry things. We have a really, really hard time of leaving things in the past, and we bring them into the future, and it creates this breakdown. The next thing is unresolved conflict. We have conflict that we have yet to address, and like our baggage, we bring it into the future. Last thing, spiritual battle. There is a breakdown in our communication because there is a spiritual battle. Whether we know it or not, there is a spiritual battle happening all around us. There's a spiritual battle happening around us, and its only served purpose is to bring us down. If the spiritual battle, if, if, if the enemy's only victory today is to insert itself in between you and your spouse, create some sort of breakage in your communication, then the victory is the enemy's, right? Personally, relationally, mentally, physically, there's a spiritual battle attempting to bring us down. So how do we build this, this life filled with better communication? How do we get better at communicating with each other? How do we choose the, the life side of Proverbs 18? Well, here's your next one. Here's how we do it. I think that we have to choose uh, our words with intention and effect. We choose our words with intention and effect. What if we started speaking intentionally? What if everything that came out of our mouth was intentional. I spend a lot of time in traffic, not in this town, but when I leave this town, I spend a lot of time in traffic, which allows me to uh, have this unnecessary amount of self-evaluation, uh, right? I just sit in traffic, and I think of all the things I need to change. And, and this past week, I had this realization, this, revolution, this revelation. I text Shana about it, and, and I told her that I want to start to remove uh, the negative side of my opinion from conversation, right? I want to be intentional about taking out the negative side when, when I'm talking to you personally. And, and, it's, and, and here's what I, I don't necessarily mean like my negative opinion of you, okay? I'm going to still have that. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. What I mean is that like, like, okay, you love the Mariners, but you hate the Yankees, right? I want to only know about the Mariners. I don't want to know your hate for the Yankees, Right? So I'm going to start being intentional about taking out my negative side of the opinion. What I told Shane is the reason, because I keep getting in trouble. Okay, Some of you need to give me more grace. I keep getting in trouble because this is what happens. Right, This is the example that I gave Shana. I'll be in conversation with somebody. And it's like I have this real good rapport happening. Right, We're good friends and we're talking. And I think that the rapport is so good, so I tell you how much I hate apples. Okay, I love apples, but I'm just going to use that for the example. And so we're talking, and we're talking about fruit. And I say, yeah, but I hate apples. And then we move on. And the problem is before we move on, you tell me uh, that your mom died on Tuesday and her favorite food was apples. Right? Does that make sense? Like I keep getting in trouble because the negative side of my opinion offends you in some way. And, and, and so I want to be intentional about taking that out of my uh, conversation. Because I don't intentionally want to hurt you. So I intentionally choose my words better. I have not succeeded at that yet, but I plan to. Please do not call me out on it later. Proverbs 29 says this, Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There's more hope for a fool than for him. Abraham Lincoln said it like this, It's better to be kept silent and thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Figure out a way to be intentional in the way that you speak. Figure out a way to be intentional in the way that you address people. You address your spouse. You address the people that you love. Here's how I think that we do it. I think we have to start taking out gross exaggerations. Here's what I mean by that. We take out the word always and we take out the word never. Right? You always do that. You never do that. Does, anybody, does that sound like you maybe a little bit? 
We put in these gross exaggerations when we are very aware that they don't always do that. Start taking it out and start building communication up, right? I think that we stop refusing to accept responsibility. Sometimes we are wrong, right? Sometimes it is our fault. And I think that when we want to make uh, our relationships better and our communication better, we start admitting the fact that maybe we are part of the problem, that it's not always the other person. Here's one for you. I think that we have to start removing the silent treatment, right? The dog house, if you will. You know what the, the number one killer of communication is? Lack of communication. How are we ever going to get better if we stop talking? Why in the world would that ever be a tactic that we employ in our relationship? Here's another one for you. Stop threatening divorce. Don't use divorce as a threat. From day one, we've had this agreement that we would never use divorce as a uh, weapon, a tool, right? Not even that we'll get to that point. We just don't even, we don't bring it into play. We don't allow that to be a part of the, the argument. It's not an option to threaten. We have to begin responding in the opposite spirit. If our goal in life is to look more and more like Jesus, we have to start to respond in a way that Jesus would respond. When he was on the cross, here's what communication looked like for him. Okay, people are hurling insults at him. When Jesus was physically dying on a cross, people were hurling insults at him. Physically in pain. I can't imagine the emotional pain that Jesus was going through because uh, at the same time he was experiencing this physical pain, he was also experiencing this emotional pain because his friends had abandoned him in the time that he needed them the very most. Right? He's experiencing this physical pain. He's experiencing this emotional pain. And at the same time, for the very, very first time in his life, he's experiencing the separation between him and God. Because all of a sudden, Jesus is taking on all of our sin. And there's this separation in the midst of his greatest trial ever. He says, Father, forgive him. Like, what about that kind of communication? What about that element in our life? What if we looked at life in that way? And we look at that story, we look at Jesus on the cross. Jesus is the Son of God, right? He is God. And so we look at him and we say, it's easy for him because he's Jesus. I look at it and I think it solidifies why we need him even more. Because he is the one that has communication on lock. Because if I want to be better than this, if I want to be better than who I am right now, I need Jesus to push me forward. If I want my communication to increase, I need Jesus working in my life. Christ makes me a better husband. Christ makes me a better father. Christ makes me a better friend. It makes me a better son. It makes me a better brother. If we want to be better than this, pull Christ into it. I could not adequately succeed with the relationships that I want to without him in my life. If you want a healthy marriage, learn to replace the things that destroy and distract with the things that build up, right? Here's your second thing. Make tone and timing part of your strategy. Make tone and timing part of your strategy. Listen, the louder your words are, the less we communicate. All right, the louder that our words are, the less we communicate. I do not believe that your arguments will ever come to, to a completion in a healthy way if all we're doing is shouting, right? Our tone matters. Proverbs 15 says, gentle word turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The difference in words in reference to, to uh, how we hear them doesn't come with the letters on the page is in the tone that we use them in, right? Who cares what the words are, but when our words sound biting or harsh or hateful, we hear them differently, right? It doesn't matter the words on the page. If we're, if we're in this argument and you're being incredibly mean to me, and I'm like, shut up. And I'm just like, hey, shut up, you know? Like, shut up. Like, you're not going to care. But if we're in this argument, I'm like, shut up, Right? Like, all of a sudden, it brings value because I've changed the tone of my voice. Our tone matters. The tone of our voice is everything because the tone of our voice will communicate what's in our heart. 
And for an argument, I'll never tell you to shut up. It's just an illustration. But our tone matters. Proverbs 21 says, He who guards his mouth and his tongue keeps himself from calamity. Sometimes we need to stop and think before we communicate what we want to say. Before we send the text, before we send the email, before we pick the fight, before we throw it in our wife's face, before we throw it in our husband's face, we need to stop and consider what we are about to communicate to the person that we're with. And maybe they don't deserve our patience. Maybe they don't deserve us sitting one out while we regain composure and come back in a healthy way. And yet again, look at Christ on the cross. He did what was right to correct a wrong, not to prove that he was a some incredibly good God, not to, 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 to prove how good he was, but, but to repair this relationship between us and God. Christ responded in the way that he should respond to repair a relationship. That was the purpose that he was attempting to serve. Tone is key, but timing is key as well. Christ came to us not at the very beginning of the book. Right? Like we didn't start it off at the beginning with Christ. We talk about Christ, and Christ is littered throughout this, but Christ didn't show up until the middle. Right? Galatians chapter 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. When the fullness of the time had come, timing was optimal for what was about to happen. Sometimes we need a good lesson in timing. Right? Ephesians 4 says, don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Here's what it means. Deal with the problem as quickly as you can. What it doesn't mean is that we rush into something and we say things that we're not supposed to. Timing is key to communication. Don't have the tough conversations when you come home from a long, hard day's work. Don't have the tough conversations when you're distracted by something. Don't have the tough conversations when your kids are around. Figure out the optimal time to have the needed conversation and communication. Here's number three. You still with me? Share the last 10%. Share the last 10%. Here's what I mean by that. We typically, uh, as couples, share 80 to 90% of our information, right? We're very, very honest with our spouse all the way up to 90%. And then we save 10%. That's the stuff that we don't want to share, It happens because we're afraid. It happens because we're embarrassed. We feel stupid. Sometimes uh, we feel like maybe it's going to hurt the person that we love. So we save 10% because it will probably create an issue. Here's the deal, though. If our spouse doesn't know the real us, then it will be impossible for them to love the real us because all they know is this inaccurate version of us. Right? Right? Proverbs 26 says, a lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. But then we contrast it with Proverbs chapter 27, which says, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses of an enemy. Wounds from a sincere friend, honesty, are better than the kisses from an enemy. Let me flip the script a little bit. Okay, are you open to a difficult word? Are you open to the other 10% that maybe your spouse is holding back? Are you capable of receiving something, sitting on it before you react to it, and then coming back with a, with a level head? Are you open to an honest word even though it might hurt? Maybe it's a word of correction for your life. Are you open to it? Maybe it's not the most encouraging word. But it's something that we need to hear. Are you open to it? It goes back to what we've talked about the last two weeks. Are you a safe place for the person that you love? Can they come back with the other 10% and tell you? Make sense? Here's number four. Work as quickly as possible towards forgiveness and healing. Remember, timing is key, right? Timing is key. Finding a way to reconnect is crucial to the health of our marriage, to the health of our relationship. Chapter 15 says, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. We hold in our hands the ability to change the game, to move from hurt to healing. You do. Nobody else holds that ability but you. You hold in your hand the ability to change the game, to take this this bad communication to good communication. The question is, how long do we hold on to the pain? How long do we sit in the hurt? How long do we wait before we act on it. 
We have to figure out the approach to, to, to getting to reconciliation because of the things that we value. And really, it starts with this open line of communication. Because really, we want number five. We have to make amazing our goal. We have to start making amazing our goal. Chapter 16 says, kind words are like honey. They cheer you up and they make you feel strong. Here's what I want for your relationship. Here's what I want for my relationship. I want them to be amazing, right? I want them to be amazing. I want the relationship that I have with my spouse to be amazing. I want the relationship that you have with your spouse to be amazing. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle through things sometimes. It doesn't mean that we don't get hurt. It doesn't mean that we hurt, that we project hurt, that we hurt others, because it all happens. We will always get burned at some point in our life. The key is that we continue to go after great, right? That we strive for this amazing relationship in our life. Go after great because God has set you up for great. God has set you up for greatness. God has set your relationship up for amazing. Why in the world would we stop short of amazing when God has allowed us to have amazing? The first step is to fix the line of communication. All right? Come on, Craig.